just a learned skill. No one comes out of the womb like, hey, <laughs> here I am. I'm going to always be myself and not compartmentalize my life. For those people that are always dropping the, like, the one-uppers and they're always dropping like the people they know, those are always like the most insecure people. Even if you have idiosyncrasies that you think the world will think are foolish, you think of those as like amazing idiosyncrasies that make you unique. Today's guest is an advertising legend in the making. After 10 years in the industry working with PlayStation and Levi's and Disney, he co-founded the San Francisco-based creative agency, Mechanism. Now that agency has gone on to produce campaigns for HBO, The North Face, Pepsi, uh, Miller Coors, and Ben and & Jerry's. They've won award after award, including Small Agency of the Year by Ad Age top 50 most creative companies by Creativity Magazine. They've produced Super Bowl commercials, and our guest has been named in the top 100 influencers by Creative Pool. His methods have been studied by Harvard Business School, and he is the author of this book right here, The Soulful Art of Persuasion. So please help me welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, Jason Harris. Jason, real quick, so to start, uh, the, the theme that I got from your entire book, which I don't think is ever mentioned, you can use any word for it that you want, but the theme that I took away from it is really being persuas persuasive, being persuasive yeah. Yeah. really comes down to one, knowing who you are and what you stand for. And, and but, but, but more than that, because I think a lot of people talk about this, but more than that, just a tremendous amount of courage. Like it takes most of the stories that you share of yeah. doing things the right way or doing things the wrong way or learning along the way, for me, I just, I get inspired because I go, I wish I had the courage to say mm -hmm. no as often as you need to say no. Yeah. So that way you can hold out for the things that you really need to hold out for. Or yeah. I wish I could have enough courage to sit in front of, you know, Disney and say yeah. like, no, that's not hey, good. Man, I know it's not good because you didn't win the business, but yeah. it's the courage. Like, yeah, like I, I am not that courageous. So, so, so I end up, I, 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 you know, I play the long game. I do all of those things, but I just, I buckle under the pressure of holding out or of saying no client. I'm yeah. sorry, but you have to do it this way. And if you're not willing to, I, I'm sorry, we're just not the right partner. Like, right. Ugh, where, where does that courage come from, from, for you? Uh, well, I think, you know, the, the, the book is set up, it, they're sort of building blocks. And I think you, you nailed the first one, which is before, and you know, this is, this is tried and true, before you can um, do anything, be in a relationship, have a successful business, you you know, uh, advance your career, know what where you want to go, what your end the end of your story is going to be, where where your goalposts are, you have to really know what values you care about, what's important to you, the way you want to perceive the world, the way you want to go out into the world, and that comes through this idea of being original or being yourself, you know, there's only one of me, there's only one of you. You got to know what makes you tick and what you care about and what fundamental things are sort of non-starters for you. And that takes a lot of time. And, and it's, it's easy for me to write a book in my forties with some wisdom because I've gone through my twenties and my thirties um, to get there. So, so hindsight is 2020. But at any age, you need to start thinking about the things that you care about and what's near and dear to you and things that you aren't going to bend on and how you want to show up. And I think that building block of, of know thyself is the fundamental uh, sort of thesis, and that's the starting point. And so I think, you know, you can call it courage. You can call it, but for me, it's less courage. It's really knowing yourself hmm. and knowing what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And it's more about honesty than, than courage. I think it's more about being an authentic version of yourself so that you can uh, say no to things or, or hustle things down that you really want because you're aware of it. And you're not, you're not a pinball machine letting life take you on, its, on a course. You're, you're sort of trying to, to lead, lead where you want to go but to do that, you really have to know yourself first, which is a, a journey. I well, it, the reason that I, I said courage is courage isn't usually a word that 
that I uh, pull out. I, I typically talk about bravery or on the other side of doubt, fear, insecurities, all those other things. But yeah. um, I like I like honesty as the word as well. But I think the problem I run into and a lot of people run into is is one. I mean, we're tremendously insecure. Everybody is, but we're tremendously insecure. A lot of us don't want to admit that we actually just don't like ourselves very much. And so therefore we don't believe other people will value us, like us or what have you. And so honesty, courage, whatever it is, how did you get to the place or have you, is this just part of your makeup? No, I know. Like, you're like, I know, I know that what I'm saying is right. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a good question. I don't always like myself and I certainly like myself more now with time and experience, but I think everyone, I think people are you if they come across as like they they really like them, themselves and you know when people you know those people that are always dropping uh they're the like the one uppers and they're always dropping like the people they know or the things yeah, they've yeah. done and you're like yeah i've heard that one before i know how great you are those are always like the most insecure people because they feel like they have to um, remind you of, of how accomplished they are. And they're kind of really reminding themselves because they don't, they don't, they're not that secure internally. And I think, um, you know, one part of, of being secure and confident is, you know, knowing yourself, it's, it's power of storytelling, like telling stories from your life that have shaped you both good and bad. It's this idea of, of building relationships over time. And when you're yourself and you know who your role models are, you know, who do you want to act like or what inspires you? Um, I always fall on like quotes um, that people have said to kind of get me through tough times. And I think even if you have idiosyncrasies that you think the world will think are foolish, you know, maybe you play like Call of Duty incessantly or (laughs) You know, you collect, you collect like snow globes or like, you know, Disney animals, whatever it might be. Um, I think instead of thinking of those as like weird atrocities, you think of those as like amazing idiosyncrasies that make you unique. And I think it's, it's putting your arms around those things that help you create security and courage and not being, not hiding those things in the background. Like telling your friends, um, you know, I love playing D and D, and I'm 35 or whatever. I don't know, whatever someone might be into, which sounds like really dorky to people, but maybe that's something that you know someone likes, and they can try to tell stories about it and why, what they get out of it, and how that builds a bond, um, or or you know how that sparks their imagination, whatever it might be. I think it's like the things you love lean into those, but create a world for yourself around the things you love versus trying to be embarrassed or shy about them because other people will spark to that. They're going to, what what you give off, uh, they're going to give you back. And if you are sheepish about it or embarrassed about it, they're going to, you know, sort of pounce on that or feel that. But if you're uh, emboldened by it or you feel a sense of pride about it and you can explain it and articulate it, I think that builds confidence and security. Mm -hmm. Um, So that, you know, that's the first part uh, of the book is all about, um, you know, be yourself. Everyone else is taken and really leaning into it. And that's something that I, you know, learned over time and part of what, what I wanted to talk about in the book. And it doesn't matter um, what those things are. It just matters that you are real and identify them and, can romanticize them a bit when you, when you talk to people about them. I love it. I love it. Now, now as the CEO of a creative agency, a production company, and you, yeah. you, know, you guys have done all this amazing stuff. I always, so I, I think it's a bit interesting. I've, I started a marketing agency, very, very video production based in yeah, 2006. Yeah. Uh, you were around in 2006. You might remember it was a very different world back then. It was. Um, yeah. It was looking, you've done that. It was been like 14 years. Yeah. And yeah, so we, I think, we, I think I've, uh, you know, my partners and I have been, it's been like 15 or, or we're in like this, a similar time frame of 
Um, we're, S- similar you know, time frame, yeah. very different growth path. I will say, you know, uh, a, a number of years ago, I'm trying to think what it is, maybe 16, maybe 17, you know, we came across your agency and we were like, this is this, this is what we've been wanting to build. Yeah. Like, like this is it. And my, my, my head of production and, and, you know, my art director and all my designers and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, this is what we want to build. And then we spent a few years working towards that. And ultimately, um, it was really when I was reading your book where I was like, yeah. oh yeah, like, like I, I can't sell creative because I think like I've learned that I'm actually more of a strategist, more of a positioning person and very data driven. So I think the idea of coming into Disney and, and having everything pre-created and laid out, like just the yeah. game of it. Yeah. I can't bring myself to play it, which is why I couldn't build a creative agency because I just don't value creative enough. And when I, when I read your story and look at you, I go, this is the person who should be doing this. No wonder, yeah, yeah. no wonder I, 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 you know, that, that we were. Yeah, but any business, you know, I think you got to give yourself credit. Like any business, you, you have a healthy business and any business that's been around that long is, uh, is a successful business. And I think part of, um, you know, I, I stepped on your question. I don't know where you were going with it, but I was going to say, I think, you know, knowing, knowing yours, that's part of like knowing yourself is knowing like, this is what I care about. This is what I'm passionate about. These are my strengths. And that's what I'm going to focus on. I think is, 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 you know, you can applaud that. And also like, we're much bigger now, but that doesn't always, that's not always a good thing. You know, that it sounds great. It maybe looks great from the outside, but when you build a, a company, you get to a point where you have, you know, 50 people and you've got payroll and you've got expensive offices, which we're still paying for. We got four offices right now and no one in them. And, you know, once you start growing, the only way you can do it, do it is like you're putting coal into the furnace. You got to keep going to have the machine run. And there's no way you can go backwards from that. And there's a lot of times when I, I'm like, I'm certainly proud and I, I love the company and love what we do, but there's also times where I'm like, I wonder, there was never an inflection point where we sat down and said, why don't we just stay where we are? And that's okay. And in America, like that's, that's never, not okay in America. That's <laughs> never okay. It's like, it's like grow, grow, grow. Every article is like growth charts and how much the stock went up and what your revenue is and your, you know, how was your profit margin? And so that's not necessarily healthy. You that's know? interesting because because this year, so uh, we're a smaller company than you by by a lot of means. But uh, last year we were at twenty four full time staff. We're at six right now. Uh, our business yeah. has contracted by seventy yeah. percent. And what I've learned through the year was like, oh, a business can contract. Oh, you can survive this. You can restructure. I love that. Yeah, and yeah. and actually, uh, Ray Dalio's book Principles he speaks I about love that book, yeah. his growth in the seventies and eighties, and then and then he almost lost everything and had to start again, and then he spent yeah. fifteen years rebuilding. And I was like, okay, okay, yeah. we have a bit of time. We can yeah. we can contract, we can consolidate, we can figure this out. But but you just let in perfectly the question that you stepped on that I wanted to ask you is yeah we are we are in an industry where we are building ourselves, our businesses, our own brands and our clients brands and our clients businesses, you know, and often I go like, Oh man, how easy would it be just to wake up one day and only have to build my own business, yeah. not my business and other people's businesses. But whenever I think of really being me, like, like really putting myself out there, um, I always think which version of Mark is this? This version of Mark, I'm, I'm super, super, super transparent. I just assume no one's watching. And so I share everything. But in the corporate thing, I go, how will this reflect on the company? How will this reflect on my clients? What will they think about it? Hey, that machine that you talked about building, that payroll that you have to make, the fact that you have to grow, that if it's project-based work, you might, you know, it's not, it's not recurring revenue. It's not coming back all the time. So do I really, is it, can I really put myself out there? Yeah, yeah. How have you managed that because, because, you know, you seem to be the captain of, of authenticity right now. I mean, that's a, that's a heavy title, but, um, I think, uh, it's a learned skill, you know, and no one, 
No one comes out of the womb like, hey, here, here I am. I'm going to always be myself and not compartmentalize my life and be myself, the same person in every scenario. I think that takes time to build, but I think it's important to really fundamentally focus on it and really try because it's really exhausting to do the other thing where you're showing yes. up as Mark in this way and Mark in front of the company. And there's a certain degree where you might – inspire people in one way and have your own conversation in, inside your own monologue about, um, you know, what, 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 what makes you tick and it might be slightly parsed out, but I think in, in aggregate trying to show up as the same person makes for a more holistic and satisfying experience. And I think people love that. Like, I think they feed off of, the, uh, the authentic Mark, you know, like who, who Mark is in this podcast room right now is like Mark at his, at his best. And I think that performance of Mark is like the best, best, best way to be uh, in, in all aspects. Now, of course, like there's uh, conversations you might have with your friends that you couldn't have at work. And, you know, there's, there's certain um, ways to slice it, but I think in general, my belief is you should try to show up in the same way in every way, everywhere. And, and at work, we try to encourage people to bring their true selves to the office because those different opinions are going to create the best output because of diversity. And I think when you're, because I've worked at places before, you know, uh, this company where, you, I mean, I certainly had to show up in like a different way and a different character to be successful. And it's just tiring, man. It's like, <laughs> it just costs too much, right? It, it costs too much. Yeah. It's just like, how, how can you focus on helping a brand or doing that project when you're worried about your internal, internal politics or how you look at work or, or how you show up? It's too much for the mind to like, grapple with, I think. Hmm. Um, so anyway, I've always tried to preach, you know, wave your, wave your fleet freak flag and show up how you want to and, and totally be yourself. And, you know, that might not, that might be, you're not the right fit, but you know, most of the people will be the right fit and they'll be themselves and they'll have a lot more satisfaction when they're, when they're doing their work mm -hmm. also. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Uh, you know, I, I, I think I heard it. I can't recall who I heard it from, but the, the, the old quote, right? Like that specificity is the heart of narrative. Yeah. And you know, what I try to explain to clients and, and I think that you do just a beautiful job of articulating this is, um, you know, I'm sure you come across this, right. Where it's like, Oh no, we can't, we can't, uh, tell a story about a single young African American, um, mother. Yeah. Because most of our audience aren't those people. But it's like, right. it's like, yeah, but the more specific you are, the better, the, the more attractive it'll be for all of us who have mothers or can understand, right. place ourselves in that situation. It's this weird counterintuitive thing of like, you know, the more you reveal about yourself, the more specific you are, the more open you are, you think you'd be pushing people away, like everybody yeah. away. But in fact, you're actually becoming more endearing just by the nature of you specific, sharing it, right? It's specific, yeah. It's almost like, yeah, the argument is like it's too niche. But if you go broad and not specific, no one's going to, it's going to be wallpaper. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's, you try to talk to everyone, um, I think that's a really good point. I love that quote uh, that you said. Specificity is the heart of narrative. Yeah, it's so, I think so, it's so real. John Hodgman. Who oh, okay. has a podcast now who is in the Apple commercials. I think yeah. I picked it up from him, but yeah. I, I don't know who said it, but it's one where I'm like, Oh man, it's, it's how'd you get, how'd you get into like the, the podcast game? How did I get into it? So, um, I'm an, uh, apparently an audible person. Cause I started listening to podcasts in like, uh, seven or eight maybe. Oh wow. Yeah. So I was listening to podcasts early on and then I was like, I, I love this. I love the idea of long form. And so in uh, 2014 or 15, we started specifically a video production based podcast where we just, I don't know, we did 50 or 60 episodes talking about the challenges of, of, of being, of being able to produce the best uh, kind of video campaigns or what have you possible. And then really it was like, I, 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 I don't read very much. 
Yeah. And every time I read, I'm like, oh man, it's like, I need to, I need to connect with these people. I have to have next level conversations. I need, you know, you're, you're a collection of the people you hang out with in the books you read, but I don't read. So, yeah. so, so this so you is might my, as well hang out with people. I might as well hang out with awesome people. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. Cause that takes, I mean, that takes courage and confidence, you know, to, to do that and, and push those one-on-one -on -one conversations and then film it and put it out there. Well, I, I mean, as long as we're talking about this, I will open up, you know, like every podcast I finish and I go, I really should have pushed harder when they said that. And there's this moment of like being really uncomfortable. And in real time, I have to render out, is it worth me potentially upsetting someone to, to push and ask that question? And if so, like, should I, shouldn't I, this or that, you know, um, uh, because honestly, I want to go deep with people and you, you yeah. don't know me and I know more yeah. about you than you know about me. So it's very hard for you to cut, show up and do that. But, um, to me, it wasn't starting the podcast or even having the conversations. It's, it's, can I actually push hard enough to get the type of conversation that isn't everywhere else? And yeah. I like that. Yeah. That, that, that I'm not good at yet. I'd say. Oh, okay. Well, you're, you're, gonna, so, you're so here. Oh, I just, I'm just done right, a me. trick on you. Ready? I know now I'm ready. <laughs> you ready. What's All the right. hardest, what's the hardest thing you've had to face in your life and what did you learn from it? Uh, I'd say divorce. Divorce. Yeah. When, when did that happen? Uh, well, it's, it's wrapping up now. But oh, I'm so, I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right. I'm sorry. All right. You don't have to. Hey, man, you you set up the push question. I did. I did set up the push. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's certainly like family members and dealing with death, and but and I mean, if if that's the hardest thing, I guess I'm pretty fortunate. But it's it's a mental, it's a real mental, um, a lot of mental jujitsu to be uh, strong for the people that you love and to show up in the way that you want and sort of handle it and then still like run a business yeah, and write a book, promote the book, like, it, it, and do all those, those other things when, you know, your base is like, is like shaken. Um, mm. so that's probably, and it's also recent. So that's like a recent hard thing, um, that I'm going through. But and, I mean, and no, and no one, it's, been no like one. A year, it's been like a year and a half now, but so it's not super fresh, but I look back on when it was super fresh and like making those, having those conversations and the anxiety that came with that was, was real, you know, it was really challenging. Hmm. I've yeah. heard of, um, I have not, I've not been through a divorce. Well, you have four, you have four kids. So you got no, you, you, you can't do it, man. You got too many kids. <laughs> My wife and I have been together since high school. So that's the good news. But, oh, right. uh, you know, I've, 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 I've heard it say, you know, like, even though there's reasons, of course, it feels like the ultimate rejection because this person is saying, Hey, I wanted to be with you and connect with you. And now I no yeah. longer want to be with you or yeah. with you. And it's just like, it gives you a chance to, potentially reflect on all of the things that you're not very great at. How did you, did you, did you lean more into the like, Oh, wow, I'm, I, I've really screwed this up or I'm not good or I'm down or this or that. Or did you quickly be able to move into the, like, here's well, the lessons I can learn. Here's how I can get better. Oh, I I'm really a rock star in these areas. Well, I think, you know, it taught, it, it just taught me a lot because I think you, you know, you, which is true. And you know, you've been in a relationship for a long time, but you, you either grow together, or you grow, you grow apart because you're not, you're not the same person that you were, you know, every, isn't it like your cells regenerate every seven, every years, seven, or every seven yeah. years or something. So like, you know, I don't know if that has anything to do with it or if that's just a, a good thing that people say, but I think you, you do see, you know, it happens in small moments. And then over time, when you look back, you're like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm very different than I was. Uh, when, you know, if you look at like old pictures or old events or things that happen. And, um, I think we just, you know, it was really, we both knew it. It was just like, we both were, you know, going in different directions. And I think, um, you know, one, one big thing I learned from that experience was, and the book kind of brought a lot of it out because I was, I was sort of writing about these things I believe in and I had to make sure I was living up to them and mm -hmm. in every way. And it really, um, 
to me really made me learn just how important um, letting, not letting things uh, build up and build up over time, but ta tackling things as they happen so that they're not, you know, you're not getting like levels of resentment that are built up over time and you're, you're handling things as they come. And it's not like you have to handle every single thing because God knows in relationships there's a million things. But it's, it's, it's having that, that communication line and being yourself and being honest, um, even with hard stuff, that's the most critical thing that I learned. And not just putting things off for a later date. So how does that, how is that applied now to your relationships, to your life, to your business? Um, I think I'm just more, um, I'm much more vulnerable. I'm much more open. Um, I think I, I take fee feedback, uh, a lot better. I think I will communicate, um, early on if I'm having, you know, either tension or a hard time with someone. And I think I'll do it in a, in an empathetic way. So I think it's made me, um, you know, even, even more empathetic, but also, more vulnerable and then, and then just always trying to, uh, communicate and kind of over communicate. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's been a big change. Um, and it's been, so that's been like really a great output of it. So, I mean, I, I know from your book, you know, you were valedictorian, you know, you, 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 you've, you've been in marketing, you've been in pitches, you know, there's a certain amount of performance, involved in doing what we do. Uh -huh. When you say that you're more vulnerable now, were you not, was it, was I was it never vulnerable before or, or was it all like a, like a suit you'd put on and that's what you'd wear? Or? Oh, I see. You mean in the past? Um, yeah. In the past. Um, like, how did you get to this point? Like in, in deep into your forties where you're like, yeah. now I'm going to be more vulnerable when, when I, think you've been vulnerable for a very long time. Yeah. That's I think difference. I think it was, um, I'd say it was like sporadic vulnerability. You know, it was like when, when things were set up and I was comfortable then I could open up. Um, and, and it was, uh, you know, sometimes it's almost like, you know, the Heisman trophy. It's like, you got one hand like this. Uh, and now I feel like it's, it's like constant, vulnerability versus sporadic. I think that's been a big change because there, I've definitely always been, um, able to express myself if thing, if the environment's right and if I'm comfortable and if I know what I'm, how I'm going to address something. Mm. But now I think it's more, um, spontaneous vulnerability and just trying to be vulnerable all the time. And then empathy is, is a, is a big one. That's one skill. You know, the, the book covers four main principles, original, generous, empathetic, and soulful. And empathy is one that I really had to learn. And because some of those principles, if people read the book, will come natural to them. Like they'll be like, you know right. that's, that's so funny. Cause what I found when, when your team said, Hey, what is it that you want to speak about? Yeah. And I was like, I want to talk about original and I want to talk about, uh, uh soulful. Yeah. Uh, you know, because, those are the two that you, because those are the book. And in the middle, I was yeah. like, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Empathetic. Okay, cool. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's do the generous. I feel yeah. like I'm pretty generous with my time and all of these things, long game, no problem. You know? Uh, and so, so that's how people read the book. Like the things that they're like, well, this is obvious and it's obvious to them because they naturally do it. But the things, you know, of those four, there's usually going to be two that you need, you need work on or you need, you don't, you, you don't think about it that way. And it's going to be different from everyone else. Like for me, those two original and soulful were probably the most natural for me. And then the generous and empathetic ones are skills I had to learn over time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost like we're the opposite. I, I think so. Now, yeah. what did, if anything, becoming more empathetic, becoming more vulnerable, what did this cost you? Because you know, there's, the, the, there's, there's always risks, but the perceived costs, the perceived risks are in my experience, usually much higher than what really happens. Did becoming more empathetic, becoming more soulful, putting yourself out there more, um, checking in all of these things that you had to work on. Did it, did, yeah. did it cost you anything? Cost me in terms of what, like 
Um, did your best friend show up and say, Hey, you're no longer you. I hate this version of you. Um, I'm out of (laughs) here. Like did, did your biggest partner say, I'm so happy. Thank you so much for finally being you. We can no longer work with you. (laughs) Did did it Uh, it actually cost you anything? No, I don't think, I don't think it did. I think it, it benefited me much more than cost me anything. Um, so why didn't, why didn't, and, and I'm putting in some, why didn't you do this earlier? Yeah. Oh, why well, not? You can push as hard as you want. <laughs> you already got me to talk about something I never talked about. Uh, so, um, I think it's, it's, it's more of where I wanted to get to. Like, it's like a habits I wanted to have that I had to learn more than why didn't I just do it earlier? It's not like, um, to be more successful, I knew I wanted, I had to be generous and therefore there would be a payout. It's more of like, these are ways I think people should behave for the best outcome in in business and life. But you're going to have to learn how to do some of these things. Some of these things will be innate, but some of these things you'll have to learn. And so, um, I don't know that it cost me anything and I don't know that, um, why I wasn't doing them earlier. It was more, I had to put my mind to understanding it and learning it. And then I could be it, but I couldn't, I couldn't just be it from the get go, you know, for the, for the most part, when you look back on the career and the agency that you've built uh, and, and all the time in front of you, does time affect you at all? Do you ever feel behind? Do you ever feel like you've wasted time or that, man, if I just knew this stuff 20 years ago, it would have been so yeah. much better. Yeah. This is like the Gary V uh, thing about like how, how you have a lot of time. Um, no, I, I, I mean, it's hard for me to, to think that way. Um, but th- that said, I wish, um, I wish this stuff was crystallized when I was young, when I was younger. Um, cause I, you know, I think in my thirties to forties, um, I was behaving this way, not necessarily with a roadmap, but because on like instinct and how I saw the world and different places I had worked and what my core beliefs were. But yeah, I feel like if I had this info in my twenties, um, that would be amazing, but I don't know, maybe I would have thought it was it and not accepted it also, you know, but that's oh, right. Why I put the book down. I, I think that book is really good for people starting businesses or, you know, pivoting, uh, their business or changes in their business, or even like someone graduating school. Um, I think it's, it's really good for, for that audience, um, of, of achievers. So, um, that's why I was like, well, maybe someone can benefit from this, um, that took me, you know, 20 year career to figure out maybe someone can benefit from it earlier. You know, that was part of the idea. Does anyone come up and argue with you about this? Mm, That's a good question. Um, no, I don't think anyone argues with me like face to face. I think it, you know, part of, Part of um, the the idea to write it, well, though, was I was reading, you know, I read a lot of like Ray Dalio and you know Dale Carnegie and you know uh, uh, Daniel Pink and like you know I read a lot of uh, business. That's kind of a like genre I read. I either read like business books or autobiographies of like Abraham Lincoln and Bruce Springsteen and. Or I can tell you read a lot of biographies just by yeah. the books. I was like, I was like, holy smokes! How does he know exactly what happened in 1974? Yeah, so I, 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 I those are kind of the two. You know, I don't read like fantasy and uh, murder mysteries. Those are like the two types of genres I really focus on. And I found that um, I'm always trying to pick up. You always pick up something from a business book, you know, that you can use. And I was finding that a lot of them were focused too much on. Um, transactional thinking and uh, hacking your way there or getting there faster. You know, you asked that question about speeding things along and I realized that um, they didn't, there were lessons in them and they were certainly all, all, all had their merits, but there was this lane 
that I didn't really see, which was this idea of like playing the long game and networking and not letting relationships drop to zero. And, uh, you know, this idea of never be closing, uh, which is, you know, when you lose, when you lose a piece of business or a pitch or a friendship or whatever it might be, it doesn't have to be that it's over. It's that it's over for now, but, but over time you can get back to it and, and build it back. And which takes a lot of uh, energy and strategy and commitment to do that. But I didn't feel, I felt like there was a white space that I wanted to fill with this book that I didn't really see out there. Um, so it's not that people have come up and argued with me. It's more, um, I don't think, I don't believe in some of the, the sales tactics and, you know, right. mirror, mirror and matching your audience and trying to get the person to like you because you have things in common. Like I just, I don't, I never build a business that way and I don't subscribe to it. And I think there's another path. Do you fear that people will read the book or buy the book and not read it, but let's say they read the book and go love it, but they never like the reason why I started with courage is because I think if you are going to do this, yeah, it requires a lot of you it, and it, it requires you being willing to push people away or to sacrifice or to wait or to play the long game yeah. and people get impatient and all of those things. Do, do you think people will take this or do take this and then actually hold track on it? Uh, I think, uh, no, I don't, I don't think anyone's going to, I don't think the majority of people are going to use this exact blueprint, but I think there'll be one of those principles that makes an unlock for someone mm. that changes the way they think that can be very powerful for them. So like it might be um, a person who is maybe not generous by nature, understands the value of being a generous person and sharing their connections and advice and counsel and time. And they, they're like, Oh, I, that's a big unlock for me. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that um, reflexively. And that to me is, is enough. You know, if there's something in there that changes someone or unlocks something, I think that's, that's the best I can hope for when people read it or, or listen to it. So vulnerability aside, what do you think's missing from, from most um, storytelling, let's say? And, and the reason I ask that is I think of, you know, the person who's, um, you know, stuck at home, but has a dream of doing something, you know, uh, really big, starting their own company, uh, uh, be becoming an actor, becoming a singer, becoming a dancer, becoming an artist, like, like any type of industry where, where there's a human capital that you have to put into the work and, it, and it's, it's shown it's there. What, what do you think for those people? Um, uh, so, uh, as it relates to story, what, what like other than, other yeah, than being story. vulnerable, What's, what's the thing that's missing for most people in, in that situation from a storytelling point of view? Um, well, I think um, the idea, you know, stories take many forms. They can be, um, you know, books you read or movies you've seen or role models or personal stories. I think it's about figuring out those, what, what those stories mean in your life and what the, sort of say what's that takeaway for you that you want to pass on to other people from a story that happened to you or yeah i read this book but to me this book meant something to me because i can relate to it on xyz it's taking um stories and then pulling apart a a sort of drive or move forward and i think that's that's important and then i think people in general um especially in, in America, the only story is like Elon Musk is worth more than Jeff Bezos. Like the only story is like the massive success story, but you can make your personal story super valuable because you used to be a dancer and then you became a stockbroker, which led you to, I don't know, uh, making a, a, creating a YouTube channel, you know, whatever it might be, there's value in store. It's not so binary where it's like you're successful or not. It's, it's like your story, for example, your story is great where you had a, a bigger company, 
you're you're vulnerable enough to talk about the change in scope, but you can make that story also really powerful and positive because maybe you're building it back in a new way that's better than before. And that's like a great outcome. Or maybe it's like, I just want to stay small and I can do better business this way and focus on the clients I care about, whatever it might be. Um, it's, it's, um, I think stories are about, they're multidimensional and they're not so binary and, 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 you know, in the business world and success takes many forms. And I think it's allowing your journey to create a, a really compelling story. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, I don't know, man. I went off on like a rant there. I don't know. No, I like it. I like it so much. And I realize that I'm like, just like rapid firing questions. Yeah. And I, I try to typically make everything much more conversational. No, it's good. I like it. I'm just like hammering you with questions. That's but, good. Uh, have you read Donald Miller's, Donald Miller's story brand? What's it called? Building a story brand. I've heard of it, but I've not okay. read it. Is oh, it good? That's cool. No. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good book. Wait, a, a million miles in a thousand years? No. Uh, well, he's, it's interesting. He's a fiction writer. Yeah. A Christian fiction writer oh, who wow. put all of his money into um, financing uh, a movie version of his book. And then... Um, had a huge setback kind of, I heard him being interviewed where he's like lost the house, lost the car, lost the money, living in an apartment, happiest he's ever been. Oh my God. It's awesome. And then he went and started this Institute where he realized like I, somehow Donald Miller went from being like writing the writer of blue, like jazz, this like 2003 or something, Christian teenagery type thing to like running the story brand Institute and like, being known as the guy who deconstructed narrative so that way brands could apply narrative to Oh, that's it. awesome. Uh, and, and it's a huge, like, I, I, I love these stories of the people who lose it all, but, yeah. but then build back only because I'm so terrified of losing it all Yeah, that it keeps me kind of thinking small. Yeah. I like it. So for that reason alone, I loved, uh, I loved his book, um, because it's like, it's like, uh, to me, I see it as like a comeback. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if he sees it that way. I've not spoken to him, but oh, that's awesome. I love that. I, I love those types of stories. I'll have to read that book. In, in terms of your own life, your own growth, it's not linear. We all want it to be linear. We want it to be from here up to here or whichever way it is on your yeah. screen. Um, what were some other than, other than, you know, the pitching, the business, the losing the business and this and that, what were some of the setbacks that really you're like, man, I'm so glad that 2013 happened because of whatever. Um, I mean, I think, I think they're, I think they're in the book of just, you know, did, did you read that book of the story? I don't know if you remember the story, but um, when, when Vine was popular, yeah. I, I, I put a bunch of, I was convinced by some people uh, at, at the company to create a um, sort of an organizing digital platform for Vines so people could search them. And I never really loved Vines. Like I never, I didn't understand how it related uh, to Twitter and I didn't get it. And I was like, why did, they're just trying to do something that, you know, other platforms are doing and I didn't really firmly believe in it, but I was like, Oh, this is a way we can get rich fast. And this is exciting because we'll get brands to pay, uh, to do searches and we'll be the first company to make it, you know, build this, uh, an app that's easy to search finds. And, um, you know, it's such, it was such a mess. It's so hard to find things on that. And so we poured all this money into it and developed it and built it out and promoted it. It was called peak it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think like two weeks after it launched, uh, Twitter was like, Oh, we're killing vine in my gut. Uh, so anyway, that's like a really, I'm glad that that happened. It's a really valuable lesson. Okay. Let me, let me ask you about this. So 
your business partners come to you, as you said, your business partners come to you and say, Hey, we got this great opportunity, right? You're the CEO. So now this is more of a resource and type, type of conversation perhaps, or what, you know, whatever it is. But it wasn't they, even my partners. It was like, uh, some, some, uh, a couple of creatives at the company, but, but they must've believed in it, right? Yeah. They believed in it. Yeah. Okay. So here's the question I have for you because that story is then almost exactly followed with the BMW story. Yeah, right, yeah. Where, where the guy's pitching for the business for BMW and they're holding out. And he's like, I'm like, you know, I'm going to hold out. I'm, yeah. I'm the creative director that I'm going to hold out for the right type of business. And then I came up with a tagline that my partners don't like, but I know I'm right. And I'm going to hold out. And then BMW doesn't wants to just buy it off them. And they're like, anyway, the story goes on where it's all yeah. happy ending this or that, but, but that's in conflict. Yeah. That, I, I have a conflict there. Cause I'm yeah. kind of a black and white guy. And I go, I go, okay, I don't want to make the mistake that Jason made. I definitely yeah. want to be like this guy who believes in it, but, yeah. but how can your mistake be a mistake? Like his partners didn't believe in it. So how, how, what do we do with that? Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's a really, really good insight. I think for me, um, I was, I think it's the same story. Like uh, Martin Puris who wrote the line and then BMW wanted to buy the line, but hire another agency. And he's like, no, that's our line. And the line's good enough. The ultimate driving machine, which has been around for 40 years now, the line's good enough that we're going to make them pay for it. And we're, I'm going to stick to my guns. And even when he, when he came up with it, his partners didn't believe in it. To me, that's about sticking with your, with your gut instinct and my big, you know, um, expensive mistake was also me. It's, it's not about others sticking with their guts. It's about me listening to my spidey sense and saying, mm -hmm. you know what? Like, I don't believe in this thing enough to invest money in it. And, uh, am I even going to use it? Am I even into it personally? Mm -hmm. Um, no, but these guys are, are hot and heavy about it. So let's try it. But I was really doing it. Um, not cause I wanted to, um, champion them. I was doing it because what if we could make a much, quick million dollars yep. and sell this thing or a couple million dollars or whatever. That's why I was doing, it. I was doing it for the, not cause I believed in it or wanted to, I was doing it for the money. Yeah. And so that was the expensive lesson. But I think both the lessons are um, connected in you, you have to, your instincts, you, you've got smart. If, if you have good business acumen in any way, your instincts are telling you what to do and you have to really be in, in touch with them and listen to them. Hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I think they're connected. That's super. Interesting. And, and so how has that saved you in the, in the years that followed, you know, that was in 2017, I guess. So how did that, how did that, um, how has that served you in the last few years? I think it's, um, it's helped me in, you know, even through the pandemic with the business of, um, trying to evolve. And if I feel like we're being, we're static and we're moving too slow and we're not in touch with the market, I really listen to that and try to, um, you know, work with the partners and push the company forward into new areas. Um, and I, I think that served, served me well so that we can, you know, be survivors and, you know, you know, this business is like, it's like a knife fight, you know, it's like hardcore. You're like always trying to get new business and you lose something, you win something. And so, um, listening to that instinct really acutely is, I think helped us and my partner's instincts too, but it's helped us, um, you know, survive and thrive. And, you know, in 2008, when the economy was it, you know, in, in 2020, 2020, when it was, you know, garbage. Um, so it's helped us sort of go through those different um, hard times. There was a day, I, I can remember this, it was in May. I don't remember the year, I think it was maybe 2016 or 17. There was a day where for whatever reason, on one day, we lost, we lost two national campaigns that had already been signed. And another one was put on a pause in one day. It was like, it was like, 30 or 35% of our annual revenue in one day was just like two disappeared that were already signed. And one was just put on hold. And we were like, <sighs> and our fiscal year ends July. So we were like, we were like, great, great. <laughs> oh man, that was brutal. 
And then I remember going like, this is the end. Like this is, this is the end, right? Like we only have three more months to make, you know, to, to hit fiscal year end and this and that and all that. And then I realized it, it wasn't, you know, it, it yeah. wasn't the end. And that was another lesson I learned this year with contraction. Like you can contract as long as, as long as you're getting ready for kind of what's next, you can, you can go up, you can go down. I think contract contracting actually really helps because, um, you can be more nimble and change quicker actually, um, without all the sort of, you know, bringing everything along. Oh no. If you can afford the contraction. Oh, Oh, you're uh, the camera. So, so sorry, YouTube, YouTube people, my camera dropped. We're going to keep going though. Um, let me ask you this. What's the question that I didn't ask you that I really should have asked you? Um, I think the idea of uh, why is it important to be a soulful person and what do I mean by that? Awesome. I would so say that was a question. So, so to me, um, and this goes back to uh, confidence and security and being yourself when, and, and this happened to me in you know, I didn't get there until 2014 with this idea of doing things beyond myself and being more soulful and inspirational. And I think whatever line of work you're in, however healthy or unhealthy your business is, the idea of taking your skills and giving them away and helping other people and trying to make the world a better place in whatever you care about, whatever is near and dear to your heart that you either donate money to, or you think, Oh, one day I'm going to, I'm going to help climate change or homeless people or, you know, um, gender equality or whatever the thing is that, that you care about, you should be doing that now. And you should try to inspire people, um, by doing whatever, whatever it is that you can at whatever level, because it's going to make you, uh, feel much better about yourself. You're going to be helping other people. Um, you're going, you know, there's this great quote, like we have two hands, one's to help yourself and one's to help other people. Mm -hmm. And I never really acted on that until, you know, six or seven years ago. And it's been a massive game changer for me and anyone could do it at any level. I talk about a, a, a friend of mine who's a hairdresser who started cutting, um, homeless people's hair, um, on the, on the streets of, of London to make them feel more human and make them feel better about themselves. And, and what it really did is, is change his life. And so for me, any one of us, anyone that's listening, so that soulfulness is about being inspirational and doing things outside yourself. And then it helps you be more original. You've got more stories to tell. You're making other people feel good and you're helping yourself. You're giving yourself more confidence and more purpose. And that to me is, is, it's sort of the last principle because it's the more evolved one, but I think it's it's critical. Like it's a total game changer. Okay, there was so much that I related to and connected with Jason. I loved talking to him. Key takeaways for me. Number one, authenticity is power. If you are willing to show your true self when building your business, making deals, you will grow your business, but you're also gonna grow yourself. Number two, personal stories are very powerful and you yes you you me all of us normal people we can share our personal experiences we can tell stories and they will inspire others and number three experience equals instinct as you grow you're going to gain so much insight into what makes your business work and from that insight you can develop an instinct that will carry you through the really tough times Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world, we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes. If you need more next level conversations like I do, you've got to hear from Mr. Anthony Trucks. He blew my mind. Click on the link. I'll see you there. If you think about this, a gap between who you are and what you have and the person who has what you want. I got the gap for things I want to do, but I just realized what the gap means, right? And so the-